Anya has agreed to come all the way downtown from 51 Madison to Flora to give us a... It's a journey. <laughs> to give us a presentation about her career and where she started and how she came along the way. So please welcome her. We thank you for being here. I am delighted to be here, actually. This is an early day before engineering. Uh, and you might notice, I mean, if you think about uh, I, my age and when I was born, which is in the, in the 50s, but my mother was born in 1911. She was an, a fairly old mother, and you can, it looks like a throwback <laughs> to another era completely when you see these black and white photographs and, and the, the kind of outfits that people were wearing. So. Being from a family that had, uh, you know, at that time, she obviously in 1911 and going all the way to, uh, she was 36 or 38 when she had her, 38 when she had her first child and 44 when she had me. So the, the thing about what's important about that to me is that she never had opportunities because it was, that was the time of, they used to call it the emergency in Ireland. It was actually the war, but that's, for some reason, they referred to it as the emergency. Um, and so there, she didn't have any opportunities as a woman to get uh, further her education. And it, it really was important. So we all find, we found our way somehow that uh, we, we uh, have been given opportunities that have led us along the way and, and opened up doors for us. The biggest move, I think, apart from my parents' focus on education, was this woman here. This was a math teacher. I mean, how could a math teacher have make such a difference to, to uh, one person? I went to a very small all-girls school. There were 120 students in the entire school, so 30 in my year. Very hard to have teachers that could teach every subject and provide the opportunities for everybody to do what they wanted to do. So we used to come in on a Saturday morning, and she would come in, this teacher, not paid for Saturday morning. She would come in, and she would teach higher level math to three girls. Um, so we got a special leg up, I guess, in our lifetime. So I immediately appreciated what it was for somebody to go out of their way to help me along with my career. And she felt like all three of us could do anything. So I did decide to do something. I said, uh, what, what can I use math for anyway? Um, no, there were lots of opportunities that I could have uh, gone into. And somehow, it just seemed like uh, engineering was something that vaguely appealed to me. I didn't have a clue about structural engineering. So it was a basic civil engineering degree. And I got my degree in 1977. Um, I studied all the basic civil engineering courses. But I had a sense, right? You get a sense for the things that are somehow attracting you. And building structures was, the, was definitely there as being something that I was really super interested in. Um, and when I was graduating, there were three of us. The 5%, it's a fairly grainy photograph. And, and there really wasn't a requirement to wear white. It was pure, <laughs> that was purely a, an accident that all three women graduating from our class ended up wearing white for our graduation. That was, we were three out of 60. And um, it was a, you know, one of them went into, you know, civil engineering roads and, and bridges. And uh, the third girl on the right, she ended up going into industrial engineering. She left sort of the structural and civil side altogether. And I was the only one who really was specifically interested in, in going to the building side. So I'm, I'm sitting around in Ireland and I'm trying to figure out where I'm going to get a job that, that will be in that line of work. Um, so what's the biggest uh, structural engineering firm in the world that's one of our big competitors? Arup. <laughs> so I got a job. It was then called Ove Arup after the, their leader, um, their founder. And uh, I went to London and got a job there. It was a, an interesting experience. How many people actually start off and feel like they know anything? Raise your hands when you felt like, you I mean, when I joined that office, I said, oh my god, did I choose the right career? I'm in the wrong place here. I have no idea they were talking about things that I really felt like were way over my head for having these conversations. And we were working on uh, buildings in uh, Hong Kong. And they were tall, skinny, 
uh, residential buildings with apartments that were much smaller than this room, probably half the size of this room. Uh, and it was all concrete and walls and, you know, it was just very, very, the analysis part of it was what I was doing, which is, as, as we all know, it's something that we do when we start off. We very often get involved in running the analysis for models. So I really felt like my degree was a good basic grounding in civil engineering, but it really didn't do very much for me in terms of structures. And I think we have found today that a, a huge majority of us have, have either gotten a master's or the degrees that are being handed out in Europe right now are actually master's equivalents at this point. So I, I realized my, my shortcomings and uh, total lack of confidence. Uh, my, my boss in, in London did run into Charlie Thornton one time um, at a conference, uh, I think it was, may have been actually in London, when I had been working with, with TT for several years. And somehow the conversation came up and, and my name came up. And my boss from that time said, oh my God, what a shy person. She hardly ever opened her mouth. Okay, I think we got past that stage. I became slightly less shy over the years. Um, but that was the lack of confidence in, in, in my ability to do the work I needed to do. So I, I quickly um, realized that I might need to get some further education. But I, I got a transfer back. This was the office in, London, in Dublin. <laughs> it was a, a brownstone house, <laughs> right? And um, there were three of, three of them together. Uh, well, 10, 20, and 30 Wellington Road or, uh, that were tied together. Um, and uh, that was where I worked with Arab and did a lot of... Ireland, uh, the indigenous materials, you know, concrete. Lots of cement, lots of concrete, lots of... Absolutely no timber, no steel, really. So if you wanted, to, you know, all my experience really in Ireland was pretty much working with the medium of concrete. I still felt I didn't know enough. So. I, I went to Imperial College, and because I was still working in Ireland, and I, I took my uh, master's degree focused actually on concrete technology. So that was really where my, uh, I, I felt like my career was headed at the time. I, I didn't think I was going to be coming to the US. Um, I was doing three-story and five-story buildings. And, you know, I think five was the tallest I did while I was in Ireland. Um, you know, coming from London back to Ireland, one thing it did help me with was there was a requirement to get licensed. You had to spend at least nine months in the field. So I did my nine months in the field uh, while I was working in Ireland. Oh, I, I'll go back to go back a little bit. I won't go, won't go there yet. Um, so the, the, nine, the nine months experience in the field, I think, was something that really stood to me because it gave me a sense of understanding what goes on on a job site, understanding how, how something goes together. And that, to me, it helped me a lot in terms of moving to the next step. Um, so I, I, I'm sitting in Ireland, and I'm, I'm working uh, probably my third year in Ireland. It was five years out of school. I had done my master's. And um, my husband, John, uh, which is, this is in the early 80s, he was born in upstate New York, Seneca Falls, and he was a, so he was a U.S. citizen, but his parents had taken him back when he was a baby. So I decided I would, uh, he decided he wanted to come over here. So we end up in New York City in 1982. And in my first uh, arrival in the city, how many people here graduated in the uh, low period, you know, when, when like between 2008 and 2012 and started looking for a job. Okay, well, you will all understand how I felt. I arrived in New York City. There was nobody hiring engineers. And they were all laying engineers off. And I applied to Lev Zetlin, but I didn't apply to Lev Zetlin Associates. And there were two separate firms until a friend of mine said, because Lev Zetlin was still holding, holding, holding his own, and he had kept his name, believe it or not. So he was working under Lev Zetlin. And he was hiring, he was, no, he had a small staff. And Lev Zettel and Associates was, was what is now Thornton Tomasetti. So I finally found out there were two separate firms. And the only firm in New York City that was actually hiring people was Lev Zettel and Associates. I contacted every other engineering firm that worked with, that within ACEC and all of those, all those lists. Um, so I started, and the first weekend I worked overtime. And it never stopped since. 
you know, Jay Prasad hired me and, you know, it was kind of interesting. Well, your experience in Ireland, he was from India. He had had the same thing. He came with, you know, it doesn't really amount to a hill of beans. I said, well, that's nice to know. So we'll, we'll start you like your entry level, five years out of school. I said, well, okay, I guess I'm going to have to work my way up and let people understand what I can do. And I came in and I was back on the same sort of back step again or the back leg, uncomfortable and not, not knowing. I didn't know anything again. That was my thought process when I started to work. I was working on a steel job. Oh, I had five years working on concrete. I could do a little bit of analysis. I understood load paths. I had done my master's. You know, we, we, we learned a little bit, right? But unfortunately, uh, it really took, uh, it took a while for me to once again gain that self-confidence. And they, they say that about women, that younger women sometimes are more reticent. And I, I was at the stage where I felt like I was five years out of school. I should have known something. So it took me even a while, probably six to eight months before I could ask a lot of questions. But once I realized that I could ask questions and that everybody would answer me and give me a help in whatever I needed, that like took a weight off my shoulders and allowed me to be able. So that was the time uh, of Reaganomics. Um, and this was Lev Zetlin Associates. Uh, we, we were actually on, on 95 Madison Avenue for a while. And then we moved down to 6th Avenue. And then finally, this is where, where, we, where we are today. Um, so in my late 20s, this is not quite accurate. Now, it may be a slight exaggeration. But we did have a mainframe. I think the, the clothing might, be, might have been slightly more updated. But this was, this was how we worked. It was a mainframe. And the kinds of analysis that we had to do, obviously, was a little different. I mean, we, we did have to do hand analysis. There was no ability to go to a big model right away. And if you did run a model and had a mistake in it and, and had to rerun it, it was overnight or whatever. So it really, what it meant for us was that, that it was really important to be able to do that singular, uh, single degree of freedom or a, a 2D model or whatever it was by hand. Uh, so th that's how we learned, and I think that's why a lot of us at our vintage uh, try to insist that that's the way we do work today so that people will actually understand what numbers they're going to get out of their computer. So in the early 80s, um, you know, there, were a lot, there was a lot of work going on in New York, and then I started to do some work in D.C. I worked with Fu Manara, who was uh, with us for, she was an associate at, at uh, Thornton Thomas Eddy at the time. Um, and um, I worked on a project in Washington, so I would go to Washington one day a week or one day every two weeks. And then the next day I'd be back in New York and I'd be on, on uh, this project, which is 425th Avenue. So this is a 30-story steel building, and that was a, you know, a DC 11-story concrete building. The contractor in Washington would be, yes, ma'am, and very polite and generally fairly competent, I would say, probably. And then I would come to New York, and they would F and blind and bang the table and throw things around. But it was, it was a learning experience, because one thing I understood about New York was New Yorkers, you can know where you stand immediately with them. They will tell you how it is. And for me, that's something I've always enjoyed in New York, is I like people to say things straight to me, and I like to know that, that if they think I'm doing a bad job, they'll tell me right to my face, and that I don't have to continually uh, be worried about that. That's not the case everywhere. Um, DC wasn't too bad. And uh, Florida and, and uh, the middle of the South, uh, Duke University, where I had um, a couple of projects, um, I found that people, because I was a woman, treated me differently. So they would be extremely polite to my face, but then they wouldn't believe anything I said. So they would ignore me. Any, anybody ever have that? I mean, I, I actually hear that young men are not listened to either when they go to the field. So maybe it's not just young women. But it certainly was one of those things when I was a young engineer. And, and even and maybe not so young engineer. I was already maybe 10 years out of school. And I, I, it still had, had, had to actually prove yourself immediately with that team before they would trust you. So um, 
a little work down in Florida, a little work in, in Washington. And I, it was kind of the up and down the East Coast. I never really went further west than Newark for the longest time. <laughs> it, was, it was just up and down that East Coast. So I, I didn't get to get involved in any complicated seismic analysis or anything because at that time there was nothing, there was no seismic requirements whatsoever on the East Coast. So while my uh, knowledge was, was growing, there were big holes in it, you know, that, that does happen. And I think it's not, a, it's not a bad thing to be able to admit that there is something that you have, there's a big hole in your background. It's okay, as long as you know that there's something you haven't, that you don't know well, and as long as you know where to go. So you, you, you figure out that there's an expert or you find, make sure that you surround yourself on a team with the right people when you have something like that going on. So then I started working with Raphael Vinoli. Well, I, I, at least, no, this was the, the Princeton uh, pool was actually with Cesar Pelli. And that was, a, I worked with Paul Liu, whom many of you wouldn't know. Uh, he was a wonderful elder statesman at TT. And Paul was a genius, but maybe not the best project manager. I don't think he would object if I said that out loud. So I learned. And what did I learn? I learned one thing that Paul could help me with all of the, um, anything I needed technically, but that when I was in a room with Paul and the client, suddenly I needed to be the project manager, even though I wasn't project manager level, but I needed to be the one to take on that role and make sure that we would uh, deal with the, the project management issues. So there are things that happen through your career. That was a job where I got thrown in and had to do it, right? And, and therefore, you, you learn how to do it. And you know, I end up correcting Paul Liu in front of the client when he says, well, it might fall down. He, well, I don't mean it might fall down. And I said, well, no, it's not going to fall down. <laughs> <laughs> so there, there were things like that that, that you just have to, uh, you, know, you gradually absorb that, that, how those things should be done. And, and we didn't do any project management training. Uh, we learned it on the job. And um, that's good and bad because I think there are things that we, we probably could have, uh, could have been better equipped with had we done training like everybody hopefully in this office and, and all of our offices is learning now. So this, this was the, the crossword puzzle group. Um, I don't have Angela's picture here, but Angela used to sit with us also. So on the right, you might see, um, do you recognize anybody? I think one person didn't change at all, and that's Bob DeCenza. He looks the same today, practically, as he did then. And, and Tom is up there, actually. That's, that's Lee Petrella behind him, who, who, has passed, who passed away a couple of years ago. But this was the, the, how do you get to know your future partners? Well, you work with them. <laughs> that's a good thing, right? You ask them questions. You learn from them. When Tom, when I was doing the 425th Avenue job, Tom was doing 545 Fifth Avenue right across the street. It was a 30 something story. This was a, mine was 28 story. They were about the same height. He developed the optimization programs that we used to optimize the steel lateral systems and we worked together. But at, at that time, what was important was we got to know each other as people as well. And that those lunch times doing uh, crossword puzzles you know, built a relationship that stood the test of time because we're still here. <laughs> uh, some of us, actually. <laughs> Bob, Bob left us last year, but we're still, uh, we're still obviously very close. Um, people often ask me, is there a job that I think sort of was a, a defining job in, in, in my career that started, you know, defining me as, uh, I don't know, so anyway, it's who I am as an engineer more so than who I am as a person or anything like that. But um, the New York Hospital project over the FDR Drive was one of those phenomenal projects to be involved with. And it was phenomenal not just for the actual project and what we did building over the highway, which itself was a very interesting project. It was defining because it, I worked with a client who cared about getting the best solution and involved the entire team together all the way. They involved the CM, contractors, the design team, and his project management team together. And we, it was hashed up and down. Bob DeSenza 
worked on this project at its very early stages before he went to Chicago. I took it over from him. We continued it on. And we end up having a team dynamic that really was the most satisfying thing because everybody felt like the project went extremely well, but everybody felt like it was a, a total contribution by uh, the team as opposed to any one person. So that's the project. Now this you may recognize from, oh, from last year, firstly getting erected. What's interesting about this is if you look at the south end of that building, that is where the north end of the Rockefeller University project is that we erected over the FDI, FDR drive some 25 years after the first one was done. Rights project over the drive, and we still had uh, challenges. It may have been done before, but it was being done slightly differently the, the second time. Um, this now was the, the first Vinoli project that I worked on, and it was Princeton University Football Stadium. Um, I would say about myself that I am more pragmatic and less creative than I, I would like to be. Okay, um, We all have our, our good points and maybe our slightly weak points. So I'm not as creative as, as many other engineers are, but this put me to the, to the test. Uh, working with Vinoli, he was demanding, as he always is. And um, it, was a, it was an interesting project. It, it, we, we worked a lot, um, once again, in a collaboration with the concrete guys and with some precast people. We developed um, interesting um, uh, systems for the, uh, the rakers and the and ended up doing some neat castings. I don't know if we have any photographs of that. Probably not. Um, at the same time as doing a, an interesting, cool stadium building like that, uh, and this was Roosevelt Field Ball out in Long Island. And it was, it was a long lasting project for me. It went on for a long time. Um, we did parking garages and huge, you know, we added on top of a, a mall that was there since the 60s. Yeah, expanded it vertically when it was only one story. We made it into two story and three story. You know, why would you do that, you wonder? Well, it was, at that time, it was the highest grossing uh, mall in, in the country. It, I don't think it's anything like that anymore. Um, it's a shadow of its former self. But we just finished a second major renovation of it, which Reza Farmani up in the... Um, uh, 51 Madison Avenue office has been working on. So it's interesting how, uh, as you work through your career, it's kind of like, how many people have, have done their house and feel like it's time to do it again? Well, that's me. Uh, you know, your renovation, you do all that work. Obviously, it happens in, in, in the buildings that we work on as well. It's time for a facelift. <laughs> so. um, this was a, a project I worked on, which you can see. I, I, how many people come in on the uh, Amtrak and main lines in, in, in from New Jersey? Anybody here? You come through uh, the Lautenberg station? Well, that, that's what this project was, is. But it was designed for five high-rise buildings to be built over. Nary a one built yet. But there's good foundations in there. <laughs> And if you know a good developer, uh, you can get them to go to uh, New Jersey Transit, and New Jersey Transit would be happy to sell them the rights. But they probably have been looking for too much money to sell these rights to for years. Uh, there was a thought that this was going to be it's what seven minutes from Midtown Manhattan. It was at a major crossroads, a major intersection of the highway. Everything it had everything going for it. Well, I guess except. There's no, no need for those, for those high-rise buildings, I guess, at this point. There's still no demand. But, um, but codes change. So, I mean, quite, quite honestly, you could not build what's drawn there now because this was pre-seismic and the wind codes changed. And this is in the, you know, in the Meadowlands. So the foundation issues and seismic issues, it would change everything. So if you went back today, I'm sure we'd have a completely different approach to designing that. So... My mother would have, her wish for me was that I would be because she worked in the university where I actually went to college for 40 years. And she started as, you know, 
hadn't even got equivalent high school equivalency. She did a, some some uh, secretarial stuff, and she ended up being what was then the bursar's office, and she used to hand out the grants to people and that. So she would have loved if I could be an, uh, an academic because she saw they had three four months off. I mean that was just the summer. Then they had a month off. The so this would, would have been your life. So I started doing a little bit of teaching, and that was through Charlie Thornton. Charlie got us involved in Manhattan College first, uh, and it was uh, it was really an interesting thing to learn how to teach because teaching is doing what I'm doing now in a way. You're standing up in front of a large group of people, and you're sharing something that you have that maybe they don't know. Um, but the teaching uh, at Manhattan was, you know, difficult to start with. So, uh, how many people teach classes? Okay, I love it. The more we teach, the better off TT is because what it is, it is really good practice for getting up in front of a client and telling them whatever it is that you need to explain to them. Because if you can explain stuff to a crowd of students, you can generally get up and explain what you're doing about your building to a client. Um, so I've always felt that one of the things that we, we learn are technical, we learn about concrete and steel and analysis, but the learning about how to listen to a client and how to actually uh, explain what the benefit is of what you're doing to a client is not something that comes naturally to us. So I think whatever you can do teaching-wise, I think is a great experience, and, and I believe that it, it really helped me enormously. So Manhattan, and then Charlie got involved in the capstone class down in Princeton. So I, I got sucked into that. And uh, we take the train down there. And then there was this student in one of my classes down there. And his name was Eli Gottlieb. And he used to fall asleep in my class. Is there anybody asleep here today? <laughs> um, so he used to fall asleep. And I, 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 it upset me a couple of times. I was trying to figure out, you know, what am I? Then I thought, well, maybe he's been up all night doing something for a class. Or, you know, I used to make excuses for myself so that I wouldn't feel too bad about it. Um, and then when the course was over, and uh, he was obviously doing pretty well in what he presented, and we we're correcting all the papers, and we're looking at all the grades, Charlie says to me, you know, we really have to hire that guy. Um, I said, I'll sleep in my class. <laughs> <laughs> so obviously, Charlie was a much better judge of character than I was, <laughs> because Eli joined us, and uh, you know the rest is history. He's obviously one of our, our strongest people. But teaching allowed us to, to learn about ourselves, to stand up in front of people, but it also allowed us to get the best students and uh, have the best students come and join Thornton Tomasetti. And it was amazingly rewarding to me until it became amazingly a burden to me because it, it requires a lot of time and commitment. And we used to do a capstone class. The capstone class was a project where everybody, I think some people have been managing capstone classes up at, at, at Columbia too, where everybody did a different, they did a project, but they would develop their own design system. So, so by the time they got through all the mountains of, of submissions that they did on their entire design, you know, you'd be ready to bang your head against a wall. And then you had a deadline the next day uh, in the office. So after a period of time, we, we I, I Stopped teaching. I did, I did uh, go up to uh, Cornell to do a couple of their their one one off type things where you just go for four or five visits to, to help the senior class. And that was a lot more fun because there was no correcting of papers and uh, and and you still managed to interact with students who were really really interested in, in designing buildings. So what's the National Arts Club got to do with anything to do with engineering? It's not a new building. I didn't work on it. Anybody have any, could anybody even guess? Yes, yes, Sioni. Uh, we started having breakfast in the National Arts Club. And this was because there was a, an, at, an atmosphere in New York City amongst uh, structural engineering uh, companies that was extremely competitive. And um, now, I'm not saying it's not extremely competitive today, it is. But it, there was a point where uh, practically the of all the, of all the firm hardly spoke to each other, or they, you know there were there was real animosity between them, and we were kind of the next generation, and there was a lot of conversation about whether there, 
why, why could we not be like Chicago? You know, very collegial. They, all the structural engineers actually got together and they, they so uh, by, by knowing each other and being part of the Structural Engineers Association of Illinois, they were able to navigate any of these difficult issues in addition to sharing certain knowledge. So, uh, so about eight of us from different firms uh, got together, you know, maybe half a dozen times or more in the, in the National Arts Club for breakfast and eventually came to the agreement that we would start the Structural Engineers Association of New York. I realized that I was going to be the sucker that was going to get elected to the first president role because there was no uh, director, there was no, there was no secretary, there was no anybody to do anything. So Thornton Tomasetti became the secretary and everything else because they, they helped take care of all the paperwork and, and do all of the things that we need to do to get going. But it was, it was really, um, I thought it was uh, something that was very important for the city. Um, health, because I think, are many of you members of Fiona? A few. Um, I think it's, it's great to, to meet your colleagues from other firms and, and you, you have something personal, a little link, personal link, so that if you come up against an issue sometime and you need to call them and say, excuse me, I'm, you know, I've, I, this is happening or I'm, I had a, I'm having a peer review issue or there's something else going on, it really helps if you actually know them. So I, I, I feel that that's an important part of the professional relationship. And, and so um, then <clears throat> ownership transition. Now you might notice that there's some people missing from this. Now who's missing? Wait a minute, Tom and Bob. <laughs> I, I don't know where I got this photo, but it was wherever you guys were. You were probably out on some uh, investigation job site trying to, trying to uh, see what it, what, why something had collapsed around that time. But uh, this was uh, in, in the start. It was in the mid 90s. Um, and we had a, a really good group. You'll notice that there's one woman in there. There's still one woman in there. We're working on it. Um, we obviously, we talk, I talked a little about inclusion and diversity before, but it, it really is a, a focus for all of us. So although we still have one woman, if you look at when I graduated, I was the 5% of my class. Well, now I'm 10% of the board. That's progress <laughs> because you can't have half of me. Uh, no, we're, we're, there's a period of time where people have to mature. As long as we are getting the, the pool filled, we are giving opportunities, and all of the women are having an opportunity to get to that next level and make sure that you getting it, raise your hand and find very fortunate of the group. And, then, and it did, the time of going back to doing a crossword puzzle with those partners, it, it really helped because we started to figure out, you know, what, what could Thornton Tomasetti be after Richard and Charlie wanted to wind their way out. And uh, very happy with, with the end result. Then this is more New York. You'll notice most of my work was in New York. I mean, that I really want, became kind of a New York uh, focused person. Um, and I, I did like that uh, because because of the nature of the people and, and the work was interesting. I, I never was limited to, you know, high rise concrete residential buildings or something like that. Uh, you know, a hospital or a lab or a high rise building or something else. It was all uh, very varied. So it, it, there was plenty of work in New York and still be able to do um, different, different work. Uh, NBC Suites Hotel, downtown. Then there was this hospital I mentioned. These are all. Um, then, dot-com bubble time, late 90s, I guess. Um, this was Lehman, this is, uh, was the Lehman Brothers, which is 745 uh, 7th Avenue. This is the time uh, just coming up to 9-11. So this building opened about, um, was re ready to open about a month after 9-11. And essentially, it was built by Morgan Stanley, for Morgan Stanley. Morgan Stanley had 80% occupancy or of something of a big building across the street on Times Square. And all of a sudden, overnight, it was not a good idea to be uh, in, in this, all, all your eggs in one basket. 
literally across the street from each other, they were, were going to house all their people. So they sold the building um, before they ever occupied it. Um, so that was uh, in building in New York. So I went from my roots of, of concrete in Ireland and then doing a little bit of concrete in D.C. and uh, then started to do more steel. And, and the buildings, the commercial buildings, I really enjoyed working on commercial high-rise buildings because it seemed like I got involved, luckily, with developers who were good to work with. And they would appreciate what you bring to the table. They didn't just expect you to be able to do your technical job and develop and deliver a project that is uh, economical, but they also were willing to listen to you when you had something that might be an answer to their overall question. Because they would put their, often they would raise questions at, at a meeting that may not be a direct uh, structural issue, but if you're listening carefully, you can sometimes see a way that you can help your client, even if it is not something that is just doing uh, the best floor slab or the best lateral system. Because the best floor system and the best lateral system, that we expect all of us to do that. But that may not lead to the best building for them. You have to listen. Their priorities and what drives them may not be purely efficiency in terms of structure. So that's something that, for me, um, I learned through the, the process, and I, I really enjoyed that, that when we were brought in. And that previous project actually was with uh, being developer-led by Heinz, uh, who was one of my uh, preferred developers in New York City, simply because they treat the New York City Heinz people treat Thornton Thomas Eddy like somebody they would always go to. We're, we're their go-to firm, and it really is a nice feeling when you have a client that says, this is, these are my go-to people. And it's not Anya as a go-to person, it's Anya followed by Mike Scorzini, followed by Reza, followed by, we have, there's a whole bunch of people now that are the go-to people for them. So this project was uh, about at that stage on the right, at 9-11, and we did a a, an analysis on it to see what could we do to improve it from a, a redundancy standpoint, which is something that we did on a lot of buildings that were in construction at the time, including another building in Times Square, um, this one here on the left. The one on the right across the street was five Times Square, and it was already built. And this one on the left was under construction, which was seven Times Square, which is right on the corner between uh, 42nd and 40th uh, Broadway and uh, 7th Avenue. So that was a time, and that was the first time that the word redundancy, I think, was ever raised in terms of a high-rise building that I was aware of. And it changed a lot of the way we did things. Now, it was not the first time that, that it would have been discussed in, in uh, Weidlinger at the time, because uh, you would have been so, uh, aware of, of the issues that related to uh, redundancy a lot more, because you did a lot of uh, work with anyway. But for us, for me, Particularly, it was not something that I had been involved in before. Um, Nationwide Arena in, in Columbus, Ohio, was really my only sports-related job, but this was not my area of expertise. So I did not do the long span roof. I did. I mean, I was the overall project manager, but there was a team who who, who did the long span roof. And I think it's it's okay for us to be, to accept that that we have areas that we might be. Uh, more expert in, and, and I think it's good to bring in the, the extra expertise when you need it. And 9-11, as we all know, it changed a lot of things for all of us. Um, 11 Times Square was sitting in New York, and what is the one thing that you know about New York when it comes to a, a commercial office building or a residential building? There are two facts. Fact one for a commercial office building, it's going to be steel frame. Fact one for a residential building, it's going to be all concrete. That was, they were the facts of life for the first 30 years of my, of my career in New York City. And until suddenly people said, you know, other places in the world, we, we, we can do things differently. We were doing things differently all over the world, as it turned out, in, in China and in, in Chicago and down in... Uh, 
D.C. and in California, we were doing all kinds of things differently. But New York is its own animal when it comes to the way it, it does things. It's, we, know, we know best. Well, sometimes we do and sometimes we don't, but we think we do. Um, and we sometimes are resistant to change, even if change is good. So this was, 11 Times Square was the, uh, had a core first building. So the core went up ahead of the steel framing, concrete core, steel frame building. And it was the first one since the Marriott Marquis, which was 30 years earlier. And it all related to union issues. But we were able to get the unions to go down to Philadelphia to visit the Comcast Tower that we were building in Philadelphia. Concrete core first and the steel around it. So it, they, they, they went, they visited, they looked at it, it was a perfectly safe site. They, they somehow were, maybe there was a need for more work and they were willing to think, well, let's, let's, let's get this job. We need to get, because it was a time where I think there wasn't that much on the, on the board. So they were ready for some compromise. And that became the project that we did it on. And it was great to see a, a core first building go ahead and see the city start to change their approach. And there have been several of them uh, since. Oh, that was the Comcast Tower that you see, and that's the, the lobby of the Comcast Tower. So that was where, we, where they learned from. They, they saw the, the core going up first, and then uh, that was a project that I did uh, with another developer that I liked, which was uh, uh, Liberty, um, down in, Liberty Property Trust down in Philadelphia. No longer my client, of course, because now we have a Philly office, and they are so happy with the Philly office that they don't even talk to me anymore. <laughs> I, you know, I think sometimes I, I, I get upset that I'm getting left out now. It's the best thing that could ever happen to you. You know what you want to do with your career? You want to make sure that you give people opportunities to learn what, they're, what you've learned. You want to help them um, meet your clients. And then you want your clients never to have to call you again. Now, you know, that's... That, it, it's not exactly true, but it is certainly the best thing for any firm that, that you can have, is that, that the people who are coming behind you are, are so good that they don't even care if they speak to you. And, that, and I have to say that every project and every client I have handled, handed off to, um, to other people uh, in the next wave behind me, uh, they have always uh, been very, very happy with them. So I didn't do much work outside of the United States. And then I told you I didn't have any experience in seismic. So why do I end up doing a job in Istanbul? Um, this was an architect that I knew. We just paid Cobb Freed. And you know, we, we worked with them on a few projects. And this came up. Um, and it was very interesting because there really was no seismic code um, in Istanbul, nothing updated. So they wanted people to build to some level of a code. They didn't have a code, but they didn't mandate that you used an, a US code either. So we really just had to present to the professors. So I made sure I brought John Abruzzo on board because I wasn't presenting to the professors on seismic. Um, but, but I actually did now. One of the things that is great about being in the role that I've been in all these years, here I am. I'm learning something completely new all over again. This has been every single day of my career, I have been learning something new. And that to me is, has probably been the reason that it's just been flying by, going so quickly, because every day you're learning something, it goes by quite quickly. So this was a very interesting project with twisting things and things that people in seismic country don't always like to do, you know, columns that were skewed and a lot of issues. So we had some fun with the professors and um, with, with uh, somebody backing me up who had more experience, we were able to convince them that it was uh, a well-designed building and would perform well. It was performance-based design. Uh, it didn't have, have a dual system. It had a, a core that was performance-based design. Um, and then my pr practically my only other foray into the, the other side of the Atlantic really was uh, this project with the same architect, which is Seikha Fried, um, in Milan. Uh, and it was a, a fabulous uh, project, but working in Italy was really difficult. I'll tell you why, because you would go uh, to the meetings and there'd be you know, 15, 16 people in the room. So we had a local 
um, engineer who was really great, fabulous, good person, good everything. So you'd explain something, why something was so important, and you go through four or five sentences of saying something, and then he would translate it. And it would be like four words. And then they would spend the next 15 minutes having a conversation in Italian about those four words. And you're sitting there, and my head was spinning because I could not, I could not participate in the way that I was used to participating in a project. So I, I totally understand uh, when, when you have uh, people working in a foreign environment where you don't speak the language. It's really difficult because what we enjoy doing is being able to help the client. So you need to hear everything, even if it's not about the structure. So while it was a, it was a, a neat building, it was interesting, we took it through DD and the process in, in Italy then is that they go out for design build. And they actually changed a number of things about our design. Uh, but this was an ETSE uh, roof over um, the palazzo. And uh, es essentially, uh, I think it's like two football stadiums long. So it, it, it doesn't look very big there, but, but it's a pretty interesting uh, roof. And where did I go for help? Paul Lou. So I always knew where to go to help me with, uh, with uh, any sort of analysis or things that I, I felt like I could get some good input. Um, this is getting more recent, um, Prudential Tower in Newark. Um, then we have Hudson Yard. So it's kind of like you, 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 you build yourself up and then you end up with a project like Hudson Yard. I mean, uh, how many? There must be uh, probably 60 to 80 of us in the office who have worked on Hudson Yard. So, so we have uh, in, in, in all of our offices, maybe 100, Tom, at this stage. All of the offices have participated. In, some way or another. So we have a situation where you've got a major project. Now this one was more difficult, I would say, than a lot of uh, challenging and interesting projects. Uh, and and uh, the relationship with the client was tough. But it, when you end up seeing what was built and, and what is still being built, it, it's something that you can really feel proud of being part of. So. Um, it goes on, and, uh, but luckily uh, one building is completely occupied, that's the, the concrete building, that we would never do a concrete high-rise commercial tower in New York. Now they may never do another one, <laughs> because um, it, it was done by an out-of-town contractor who wanted to do concrete. And the story went that it was, um, they came in and, why can't you do concrete in New York? And all the other contractors were going, well, you know, they don't know anything. Um, but we said the same thing. Why can't you do a, a proper concrete job in New York and do it, do it efficiently? Um, and the job itself, I mean, the, it, the beautiful concrete work, the job was successful, but they underestimated um, the impact of the unions and the getting the right workers and the schedule issues. So they, they underestimated because they were from out of town. Um, but in the end, I think, it's been, it was a, it's a tremendous success with our tenants having, you know, you can have exposed concrete ceilings. It's, it's quite beautiful um, and, and very different as a space. Uh, um, okay, let me keep moving. Hurricane Sandy. <laughs> Ali. Um, so suddenly you need to learn something new again, right? You need to learn a little bit about resiliency. And that's what I did. Uh, I got involved in a few different projects. Obviously, most of us did at one stage or another get involved. And um, I, I think I may be missing. I don't know if I did have another one or not. But uh, at that time, I got involved in the, um, uh, the committee commission for the mayor in terms of developing uh, some kind of guidelines for resiliency in the city. Um, and it was another great opportunity to actually work with people on codes. I had been on the mayor's commission for the new building code back in the, in the early 2000s when we adopted the uh, IBC, at least adopted it in its form. Um, we did change a lot of it uh, because New York still has some very good things. I mean, one of the things that's very interesting about New York City building code is that the fire requirements in New York City building code um, you know, are, are pretty stringent. And when you look, sometimes you think, well, maybe that's not such a bad thing <laughs> when you see what can happen. Um, so, 
um, I, I finally figured out with my life that, I don't know, 10 years ago maybe, that as a woman in, in engineering, you have to do more than just do what you're doing yourself. Um, and I was involved with non-traditional employment for women, which is really a fabulous organization that tries to get women into the trades. Now, they do get women in and get women into great union jobs, but it, it, it's still a drop in the bucket. There's still only 3% women in the entire construction trades in New York City. So it's, it's just a struggle, no matter what you do. Um, they've had downturns just when they've had people trained, it's, but it's, there's a real move forward. Uh, I was very upset er earlier this year, or earlier last year, when they chose the structural engineer for the women's building, which is a big renovation and a new project over in Chelsea. And initially, we went after the structure. We didn't get the structure, but with the help of a team of fabulous women, we got five or six different parts of that. We, we are doing the uh, facade, historic and new facade. We're doing historic preservation. We are doing uh, something related to the flood proofing with uh, Amy McDonald. We did, I think that, um, who, who did the, we, we, we did uh, give a fee proposal. I think we might be doing some of the interior surveying eventually, cloud surveying. Uh, we have, so there's, there's a lot involved, but that building is going to have 30% of their workforce is going to be on the job site is, is supposed to be female. So it'll be very interesting to see if they can train enough women to do that. Um, you know, you go back, it's a long time. That was 2002. So that was news, okay? More engineers and hard hats and just, it was news. It isn't news anymore, but it's still not commonplace enough in my mind. So our focus, my focus, uh, is to try and make sure that we provide all the opportunities we can to everybody, but I want to see more women. I want to see more women take You can really, uh, you know, grow your career. And um, here we go, women at TT. So this, 2013. So it's a few years ago now. And things that between mentorship and everything else, and just creating a sense of community where women can provide support for each other, and that that was one of the key reasons for women at TT, um, and I think it still is a, a key reason. But just like Tom and Bob and I grew together by doing a crossword puzzle, not by doing something technical. If you do something that isn't necessarily technical together as a group of women, you bond together and you can support each other in your, in, in your careers and, and you know, help each other as, as you move up. So what I know now is engineering as a career, um, most exciting thing I could ever have imagined doing. And I had no idea what it was when I started. But every day was a challenge. And I didn't talk about any of my technical, you didn't see a, a, a model up there. What is it? One little model. You didn't see a model up there. You didn't see a calculation. You didn't see anything about the technical side of it. The technical side of it is really, really important. That's our, that's our minimum bar. But beyond that technical side of it, what we can contribute to whatever client we're working with is, is more in understanding and listening to what they are, they're trying to achieve and just being able to put that into action as much as possible. So listen. That's what I, I would say. Listen. And when you listen, you will hear. And when you understand what people are trying to do, it will make you a way better engineer than you might be by taking one more course somewhere. I'm not going to put you off taking courses, but, but it's really important that you, you, you figure out that part of it. Because for me, um, it's been a joy. Um, I, I, I love every day. Um, so it's uh, the journey is uh, the destination is the journey, I should say. Um, it's been a, a great journey. And every day, I'm still learning something. Right? Well, thank you all for coming to listen to me.